everybody again. Welcome back to another episode of Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks. I'm really glad that you're joining us again this time. And I hope you're enjoying um, our series of, of, of deep dive talks with some of the greatest business book authors around. Um, today, we've got yet another great author, Atul Minocha, who has written Lies, Damn Lies, and Marketing, Separate, separate Fact and Fiction, uh, and drive growth. Um, Atoll is a CMO, chief marketing officer. He's a professor, an author, an angel investor, a mentor, a keynote speaker. He plays professional baseball for the Dodgers. And he is also <laughs> starring with Tom Cruise in a new Mission Impossible movie. So uh, you got at least two lies and one damn lie, too. So okay, all right. <laughs> Yeah. We're trying to get a lot of damn lies into this conversation. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 Atul could be reaching. We'll, we'll we'll be flashing your website and and also giving you uh, you know at the end. But it's it's a t u l m i n o c h a dot com is your website uh, where people can go and buy the book. Uh, Atul, thank you very much for joining me. I'm really happy to, uh, that you're taking the time. Very glad to be here. Good, good, good. And um, listen, I, I, I read through your book cover to cover, and I have lots of uh, questions about this book. And uh, so I, l- let me just start off before we dive into some of the details. And oh, and by the way, I should have told you this before we started recording. Um, and it's fine if you want to do this now, but it's good to have your book somewhat handy just in case you need to reference it. I don't know if you need to or not. If I ask you so, I, well, it's funny. It's, it's sitting over there. All right, and I cool. have a PDF. I have a PDF version lurking right behind the Zoom screen here, so you know yeah. it's never but too far. Maybe and, and a lot of it is you, still here. Well, you know, you think it's there, but you wouldn't. Uh, maybe it wouldn't surprise you how many people I talk to that are. Uh, you know, are they, you write a book, but you can't remember everything that's in it. And you're like, wait, what was that story again? Or but anyway, if you need yeah. to do that, that's uh, that's completely. Yeah, fine. no, I'm. It's, it's just close by. Yeah, great. Um, so the, for starters. Who's your audience for this book, Atul? Who did you write this for? So my primary audience is business owner, business leader, CEO, and maybe other members of the C-suite. That's sort of my primary audience. People who have been, who are, who I would think would want to use marketing to make a difference in their business, but have also been frustrated, which is a pretty large proportion of these uh, C-suite members. The secondary audience is actually marketers themselves. Because, well, if I'm trying to address the CEOs, in some ways, I'm also giving some keys to the marketers as to how can you avoid the frustration at the C-suite level. So those are my two audiences. It's primarily it's the, it's the business owner, business leader, CEO, and the C-suite. You know, it's a crowded field of marketing books out there. I know you know this. And I know when you pitch this to your agent or to your publisher, uh, you know, you know, I'm sure you were asked like, well, what is, you know, what's so different about this book? You know, what, what is so special about this book? So how does this book, in your opinion, how does it stand out from, you know, yeah, the, the dense a, that's, a, that's a great question. Frankly, even before we get to the publisher, hmm. I personally was tired of reading marketing books. So I wasn't going to contribute to my own misery, so to speak, you know, so, so that wasn't uh, the driver. Hey, we need a, the world needs a new marketing book. Right. In fact, my driver was the fact that the fact that there's so many marketing books and they come out like four a week or something like that. Why is it that we need so many marketing books? Why is it that people feel obliged to write about marketing? Well, the reason for that is because the previous iterations have not worked. So they say, ah, maybe I've got the idea and maybe I can I can do something. So I said, you know what? Let me get under the covers here. And in part, in for the last 10 years, I've been consulting and working with CEOs around the country. And uh, with very few exceptions, almost all of them were willing to work with me out of frustration that they'd had with the previous marketing, either marketeers or marketing companies or marketing agencies. So I knew that the CEO world was full of frustration against marketeers. And I also knew having worked in marketing almost 35 years as to why that might be happening. So this is, that's why it's a different kind of a marketing book. That's why it's called Lies, Damn Lies and Marketing, because basically I'm trying to tell CEOs what has gone wrong, what has fed into this frustration that they have obviously felt. 
so so it's it's not another marketing book it's it's a book that sort of uh, uh, almost tears open what's been wrong with with marketing books got it hence the damn lies portion of your title it makes right. uh, that makes sense so the book is divided up into like three big parts. You talk about the big M marketing, you talk small M marketing, you talk return on investment, and we're going to dig into all three of those parts. And, and let's start with, uh, you know, with, with big M marketing. So for starters, um, what do you mean by big M marketing? And also, what do you mean by the ultimate customer? Yeah. So uh, let's, let's approach these two questions as two separate questions. Fine. Uh, they are obviously related. So big M marketing, let me, let, me, let me back up. So when most people, most people who are not schooled in marketing, when they are asked what marketing is, they'll start describing advertisements, social media, blogs, trade shows, uh, you know, things like that. Yes. That is in some ways understandable because that's the more visible part of marketing. That's what you and I as consumers see, uh, whether we are talking about products or services, chewing gum or cars or whatever. So that's that's what we think of as marketing, TV shows, TV ads. But what's missed by most people, unless you are schooled in marketing, is that before you can get to the visible part, there's a lot that should have happened or should usually does happen in good companies, which is sort of the strategic thinking behind it. Who is your customer? What are their pain points? What should we tell them? When should we tell them? whatever we intend to tell them, what channels of communication should be used, things that are not really visible to a consumer. So the things that are behind the scenes that are not visible to the consumer, but have to precede the visible part, that's what's big M marketing. Got it. Okay. Um, so you talk about the ultimate customer and you, 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 you connect that to big M marketing. So what, what do you mean by the ultimate customer? So one of the... Um, this is a bigger problem in B2B world. It's less of a problem in B2C, but it's there in B2C as well. So if, if let's say, I mean, I, worked, I started my career at Toyota. Okay. So Toyota worldwide, uh, it does not sell cars directly to consumers. Okay. okay. Uh, regardless whether it's the US or Zambia or Egypt, they have distributors and they have dealers. Right. And these are independent uh, businesses in their own right. Right. So, but Toyota, when it thinks of its customer, it doesn't think of the distributor in Egypt or the master distributor in the US. It thinks of you and I as, right. as, as a consumer. That is the right way to do it. So even if a com company sells only through channels, only through dealers or distributors, Ultimately, it's the user who decides whether the product or service is going to be successful or not. So if you're Kellogg, you will be selling to, to Smith's and Safeway and, and, and Whole Foods and whatnot. But ultimately, it's you and I and your kids who are going to sort of enjoy the cereal and then decide whether it's worth having or not. So like in your analogy, so um, Mike, I have a 10 person company outside of Philly and um we have 10 employees, about a dozen contractors, and we um, we sell CRM applications, so customer relationship management. So we implement yep. Salesforce and Microsoft Dynamics, Zoho, things like that. So, you know, for Microsoft, you know, even though they're selling to me, I mean, I'm buying their products and reselling it to a customer or to a client. Really, it's my clients that are the end. They're the, they're the ultimate customer, right? Microsoft right. is always thinking about that ultimate customer, even though from, from an accounting perspective, you know, the invoice is coming to me, but I'm really not the ultimate customer in your mind. Is that, is that a decent analogy? That is absolutely right. If you think about it, um, in the ultimate analysis, mm -hmm. Microsoft will be, able, will be able to keep its lights on only if the ultimate customer continues to, to use their product and continues to renew the leases and the licenses and, and whatnot. Um, if, if you are the middle person and you sort of bought a whole bunch and you sort of contributed in advance, that's okay. Microsoft obviously acknowledged that and sent you the receipt for it. But in the long run, Microsoft is going to be successful only if we all as consumers, the end consumers, continue to write checks to Microsoft. 
And it's interesting too, because you're, um, you know, if you, you give the analogy of a B2B business, if I am selling, uh, if I make and I'm selling a manufactured part that's going into an assembly that's part of a machine, I guess I should be thinking that the ultimate customer is the customer that's going to be using that machine. That's going to have my part inside of it, correct? That's right. That's right. I mean, if you if you are an engine manufacturer and you're selling the engine to uh, you know um, to Chrysler for their Dodge pickup truck, right? You still have to think in terms of how the Dodge pickup truck is going to be used. Yes. Uh, because yeah. that's how you need to design the engine. Of course, you need to make sure that uh, Chrysler is able to use that engine and it doesn't take too much of an effort to install that engine in the pickup truck. But the ultimate customer is the ultimate customer and the ultimate decider. All right. So I told you also talk about like rationality testing, you know, and using a coin flip example. Can you can you explain <laughs> what you mean by that? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer by education. Okay? okay. And many of my clients, if not most of my clients, they happen to be in the technology or engineering field. You know, so they're, they're sort of technocrats or geeks or nerds even. Okay. And I, I understand. Be careful, their, my son's an engineer. Mindset. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So you know, uh, yeah, and 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 if anybody takes offense, uh, that's why I say that I'm an engineer myself. So I'm not <laughs> sort of. Uh, uh, I mean, if I'm pointing one finger at you, three of them are pointing at me. Right. Um, the the problem with with us engineers uh, are people who were schooled in the STEM uh, topics or STEM mm-hmm. subjects is that we think that rationality uh, is how it, the world runs. The more rational we are, better we are. And we believe that we are, for the most part, rational people. What I discovered through experience was that even us engineers are humans to start with. We studied engineering, but we are humans to start with. And we have a mix of emotions and rationality. Mm. So, so how does it apply to marketing? Even if you're selling engines to an aircraft manufacturer, PhDs in aerodynamics and whatnot, they are humans too. So you have to, yes, you have to give them the technological, the technology, the data and and the specs and the comparisons and all that. You have to do that. But before you do that, you have to also appeal to their emotional side. You have to make sure that you're treating whoever your audience is as a whole, not just as a rational being, but as a whole, as a human being, which is a mix of rationality and emotions. So that's that's my point about, uh, uh, I talk about irrationality. All of us are irrational to some degree. And that is the, the coin flip experiment that I, I write about in the book. Got it. But we need to be aware of that and we need to not deny it. And we need to actually play to it uh, in our marketing messages. Got it. Explain at all your your definition of what you call the infinite loop customer journey that goes on and on and on. What do you mean by that? Yeah, you know, I mean traditionally we have we have. uh, In fact, I remember when I was at an MBA program, you know, more than thirty years ago. the, the customer uh, or the way marketing was laid out was that you know, here's a factory, here's a customer, and then there are different steps along the way that will take the product or service from one end to the other. It was a linear kind of a thing. Right. Okay, made sense. Um, then when I started practicing marketing, um, I discovered that there was this funnel concept. You know, you have thousand prospects and then you sort of whittle it down to and ultimately they come out from the bottom so it is all linear one way or another you know whether it's vertical or horizontal right but then if you think about it in in the real sense and by the way all that is correct i mean i'm not dismissing those 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 visuals but what i've introduced in this book is this infinity loop and what i'm suggesting here is that a satisfied customer who comes out from the bottom of the funnel and you know writes you the check and you celebrate and you say, oh, we had a big win. Mm-hmm. That is not or should not be the end of your customer cycle. Mm-hmm. Why? Because if you continue to work with that customer, that customer can become your biggest advocate. Mm-hmm. 
And a customer advocate is a whole lot better than the best marketeer that you can hire. Why? Because even the best marketeer will sort of come across as he's got a vested interest. Of course, he's going to say good things about whatever product he or she is representing. Whereas if, if a customer says that, uh, there is a sense of neutrality to it. It's like the Amazon review, right? Of course, mm -hmm. I'm going to say good things about my book. Mm -hmm. But if you read the book and if you say good things about it, mm -hmm. chances are that it actually is a good book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it's funny, it kind of gets back to, you know, what we learned in, you know, you know economics 101 about your, you know, your, your customers being, you know, the best source of referrals and future business and, and also your cheapest source of, of, of new work. Um, exactly. So, so it doesn't end once you make that final sale. There's no final, you know, sale for it. It's one of my biggest problems at all. Just, to, just so you know, I mean, we we have about 600 clients in my company. Um, we sell a system to them, and um, and I I completely when I, I was nodding you know, vigorously while reading all about the infinite loop. You know, what, what you being a customer, being an infinite loop, because we're, we're we we try so hard to continue the relationship with a customer even after they we've implemented a project. Because there's not only a lot of more work we can do with anybody, there's other products to sell to a customer. But like you had just said, they can act as a referral and a reference and a connection point to other potential business. So, And I would like to add a couple of points here. One, in this day and age with social media, it's a whole lot easier to sort yes. of tap into your existing customer base and convert them into advocates. So that mm -hmm. one, that's, a, that's the obvious part. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you an example. It's a real example uh, where... Social media was not playing a role, but the physical interaction was. Mm -hmm. So I worked with a company uh, which is in software development. And we came up with this idea that let's do what we call customer councils. Okay. okay. So we would get customers to come to the headquarters and spend two, three days with us. And we'll show them the new okay. stuff that we are doing. They'll get to work with their teams and things like that. Sure. But the new thing that we introduced to this customer council was that we also brought in some prospects, prospects that were fairly advanced in discussions uh, with this company, mm -hmm. but they hadn't crossed the line, they hadn't signed the deal, they were probably still considering other options. Mm -hmm. By bringing prospects in touch with existing customers and letting them talk freely, mm -hmm. let, you know, there mm -hmm. were lots of dinners and lunches and, mm -hmm. and outings and things like that. The opportunity for customer to talk to a prospect was very high without any company person being present. And that was all by design and that was all good. Mm -hmm. So when the prospect heard this from an existing customer, all the, the good and the bad in working with this company, uh, the result was phenomenal. I mean, there was something like an 80% uh, crossover to the line uh, result. You know, it's so funny. It, in other words, it can be done without social media. It can be done in a physical setting as well. I'm going to get back to social media in a minute, but it's funny. You know, the whole title of this book is about, you know, damn lies and fact and fiction and marketing. There's always been this narrative that you keep your customers and your prospects separate from each other um, because you don't want, you know, them to know about where their customers might say something bad about you or divulge whatever. Meanwhile, your customers can be your biggest advocate. Um, and, you know, like you had just said, you know, the, the more that you can get your prospects involved with your customers, whether it's in, you know, you know, a, you know, a customer group like that, even if you're on, if you're doing conferences or meetings with customers to invite people that are non-customers, um, right. like it kind of overturns the narrative of, of, you know, there's this fiction that you should be separating them. And, you know, it, it, it really doesn't make sense to do that. It can help your business by being more true. Yeah. And, and even if the customer tells the prospect, some of the challenges they face, that's okay because that's the real world. Yeah, sure. You know? and, sure. And, 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 and a smart prospect will say that in spite of those challenges, if this, is, this customer is still a customer, net, net, it must have been a positive experience. Right. So, right. Makes uh, sense. so you know, there's, there's, there's no downside to it. Um, you had mentioned social media. You, you did write a little bit in the book in this first section of, you know, the big M marketing section of, of digital, you know, digital technology. And you say it's really just a medium. Um, what do you mean by that? So <laughs> that that comment came out of uh, um, a classroom setting that I had, uh, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Then one of the students uh, in sitting in my marketing 101 class in San Francisco said uh, something to the effect of, 
why are we wasting time learning all this? The whole world is run on social media. Why don't we just uh, learn social media? Right. And uh, I, uh, at the spur of the moment, I sort of uh, came up with this answer. Um, and that was that social media today is what printing press was when I was going to grad school hmm. or, or, you know, so in other words, I, and what I, the point I made was that my marketing professor spent zero time talking about the printing press and the ink and the paperweight and, and offset and screen printing and this and that. So why? Because mark, that, that's, just a, that's just a medium. Yeah. You know? And yes, I, I'll use printing press to print my brochure and a poster and whatnot. But there are people who, who learn that. I'm here to learn marketing. And my point to my student was that you're here to learn marketing Social media is just a channel, just like printing press. And I love that. And that's yet another fact versus fiction, because there is this fiction, this narrative now where people are like, well, we have social media marketing. And um, it's really not. It's, it's marketing and maybe using <laughs> social media as a medium to do your marketing, correct? Exactly. Like email. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Um, before we move on into you know you know small M marketing, which I'm going to give you a chance to define and, and revisit, um, you you did have some thoughts on pricing, and you also told a story of the tortoise and the hare, uh, version mm -hmm. 2.0 story. But first, let me you know pricing is so critical uh, to, to from the marketing and sales effort. Um, what is the psychology of pricing? What do you think is fact and fiction when it comes to pricing products? So I think pricing is a, uh, can be a book by itself. Yeah. So one of the one of my uh, one of my pet peeves that I talk about in 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 this book is that for various reasons pricing, even though you know, for those of us uh, who learned uh, MBA or learned marketing a few years ago, we learned about four P's of marketing. You know, mm -hmm. product, place, placement, you know, and and pricing. But unfortunately, if you, the data shows that very few marketeers or very few CEOs think of pricing as a marketing function. They usually delegate it to a finance function, right. which is a mistake. So that's 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 sort of one of the one of the bigger mistakes that I that I talk about. It's now, in problem. general, in general, I think pricing uh, is. In fact, there's data that I share in the book that if you think of if, if, if you're a business owner or the CEO and you think of what is the number one thing that you ought to ensure happens with the company, it really ought to be not the top line, not market share. It ought to be the bottom line. Why? Because the bottom line, if you have it, you can drive, you can use that to get to the top line. But if all you have is the top line with zero bottom line or you're losing money, then uh, you know you're not going to be having too much of a top line either in the long run. So bottom line is sort of mother's milk, so to speak, uh, right. when it comes to uh, to business. the The thing about the bottom line is that all the levers that a CEO has, you know, I can spend money in R and D, I can hire more salespeople, I can cut costs. Uh, I can, uh, you know, all the things that you can do, which apparently have a direct link to the bottom line. Pricing has the most leverage to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And when I say pricing, I don't just mean raising prices. Sometimes reducing prices will have a more positive impact on the bottom line. So pricing, from my point of view, is one of the more underutilized marketing sub-functions in the business world, which can have the most impact on the bottom line. So that's part of the, the lies and damn lies that I'm trying to wash away uh, on the pricing chapter. Good. Makes sense. You know, it's funny. I think of the example of, um, you know, you can get a steak at an Outback Steakhouse or a steak at a Ruth's Chris. And, you know, an Outback Steak is $30 and a Ruth's Steak, Ruth Steakhouse is like $80. I don't know if the difference is that. I mean, I think a steak at Ruth's Chris Haycott is probably a little bit better, but not that much. Better. But there is a there is an intangible to the pricing of a steak, you know, at a at a high end steakhouse that you um, you know it's for like a special occasion, you know, it's something that you're willing to spend more money for. It's got something around it, and I think that that all dovetails into the marketing. And I think ignoring ignoring pricing and marketing is just a it's a, it, again it's a big fiction. 
uh, people, you know, have made that mistake in the past. And, and as you wrote, uh, this is not something that uh, we should be ignoring. Uh, before we move on, you told a story of the uh, the tortoise and the hare. Um, can you can you fill us in on that a little bit? Yeah. So um, I, in my thirty five plus years in the business world, I've never met a CEO or a manager or a business leader, myself included, who is not a type A person wanting things yesterday. Sure. So I, you know, let's stipulate that that's, that's the real world. That's how people operate. That's what the expectation is. What I discovered with the experience was that, uh, and this is, I, I think I say this uh, in so many words in the book, that it's, it's worse to go fast in the wrong direction than it is to go slow in the right direction. Right. So in other words, yeah. you are much better off going slower in the right direction than dashing away at the fastest possible way, but the wrong way. Right. So tortoise and hare, I, I sort of use that as an example, as a, as a graphic in the book, where I sort of say that, that the tortoise was sort of basically single-handedly, you know, doggedly just going in one direction, knew where he needed to go, whereas the hare was bouncing around. Faster was what was bouncing around. And we know the, we know how that story ended. I think it applies to the business world as well. I've seen so many business decisions being made because they were made in haste, but they weren't made um, with any thought behind it. So it was just a matter of go, 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 mm. pedal to the metal, but whether the car is pointed in the right direction or not, nobody asked. All right, let's recap so far. Uh, we've been talking about some big, you know, big M marketing concepts. You know, um, we talked about the ultimate customer being who is ultimately going to be using the product that your product might be in um, and, and shaping your marketing direction towards that ultimate customer. Um, you, you, you've spoken about rationality and, and using, you know, it's sort of a coin flip. I mean, there is there is some level of rationality to a person's buying decisions, but there are a lot of irrational aspects too, because we're all human beings. Um, you, you spoke about how customers, just when you make a final sale to them, doesn't mean you're done with a customer. It's an infinite loop with a customer. And, and the, the more that you stay in touch with them, not only the more products and services that you can offer, you can also uh, you know, hopefully get referrals and references and connections to other business. Uh, we we kind of you, you kind of shot down the myth of of technology being in in itself a marketing thing like like social media uh, is a you know is a, is a medium for getting your marketing message out. It's not the marketing thing. Um, right. Pricing is another issue, um, and and what goes into the psychology of it, and and the fact that a lot of people, like you mentioned, uh, you know they, they leave that decision down to the CFO to determine the pricing when really pricing is more of a marketing decision because there's a lot of human behavioral right. reactions to a price. Um, those are, it, it's all great stuff. You know, so then we move into in the book, you know, what you call small M marketing. So compared to the big M marketing, can, can you define for us what you mean by small M marketing? Yeah, so small M marketing is actually easier to define because that's the more visible part. Yeah. So uh, even if somebody who's not a marketeer by profession, but is we all are consumers of marketing, so to speak, um, if you ask them what is marketing, they'll name things like you know logos, branding, uh, you know, uh, advertisement, social media posts, blogs, trade show events, brochures if they're still around. Um, all that is uh, is 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 small in marketing. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, I, uh, I do make this point in the book, but I want to make sure that I say this to your audience as well. Mm -hmm. I do believe that about 80% of a company's marketing dollars should be spent on small M marketing. So the fact that I'm calling something big M doesn't mean that uh, it needs more money uh, than the small M. Uh, it just means that it's more important to do that just to make sure that the small M works right. So right. you do big M, not for its own purpose, but to make sure that the small M actually has the higher ROI. It seems like the thing, you know, like the big M marketing is your, is your thinking and your strategizing and your planning, right? Which deserves resources, obviously, because that's, that's yeah. so critical. 
but the small M marketing is sort of the implementation part of your, of your strategy. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a simple but good differentiation between the two. Of course, there's some thinking in, uh, in the small M2 yes. and there is some execution in the big M2, but by and large, I think you got it right. Okay. Um, so Atul, why, why do you say that customers break up with brands? What are some of the reasons? That's actually a very good question. Um, the reason that there, there can be various reasons, mm -hmm. but most of them, most of them will end up being uh, or having some roots in the area of dissatisfaction. Mm. It was some bad uh, experience that they had. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how I would simplify it. Now I'll also say this: that I mean, your question implied that they have a strong relationship with the brand. Mm. I would argue that a majority of us, for majority of our products, we don't have that relationship with a brand. So in other words, um, I might, if I go to Office Depot and, and buy a ream of, of printing paper for my printer, I'm not sure I'm brand loyal to one versus the other. Of course, I'm picking up certain brand, but I'm not sure if I'm brand loyal one way or another. Right. So we are talking about two different things. One is lack of brand loyalty, even though we may be buying a brand or two. Uh, the other one is, which is I think or where, how you, you worded your question was that if I am brand loyal, if I am a user of Apple iPhone, mm -hmm. what will make me get away from it? Mm -hmm. So the latter question is, usually it's some major dissatisfaction that happens. Because if you have brand loyalty, that also implies that the customer is willing to cut you some slack. Right, right. So in other words, I won't, I won't drop Apple iPhone at the very first instance, I get disappointed. I'll cut them some slack because there's, that's the value of the goodwill. That's the value that comes from, uh, from brand loyalty. Makes sense. And, you know, you, you don't, this is not a book to like, to, that digs into branding, but, you know, listen, you've been doing this for a number of years. I'm kind of curious, like, you, do you have some thoughts on, on building a brand for your, you know, for, for a product that. Just well, like, absolutely. Yeah. One of the, one of the common myths about, um, about branding is that uh, it's about logo and, uh, and colors and fonts and how big or how bright or how imposing you can sort of put those on anything that you have under your control, whether it's your storefront or website or whatever. Right. Now, I'm not dismissing that. I think that's very important. I mean, I spend a lot of time in designing the book cover and color choice and whatnot. So all that is very important. But in the truest sense, brand is something that exists in the minds of the customer. Mm. So companies can influence that, mm -hmm. but companies don't own that. So the brand is created in the minds of the customer. Mm. So think about it. When, I, when somebody says Apple, I, I have a certain impression of Apple. I don't sort of say, okay, what is the last um, billboard or what is the last uh, slogan I heard from Apple? Apple invokes a certain uh, feeling in me. When somebody says Volvo, it invokes a certain feeling in, in most, uh, most car owners, regardless of whether they own a Volvo or not. Tesla, same thing. So brand is something that is actually created in the minds of the customer. And that's how it should be. Um, before we move on, I want to talk about some other concepts like you know, return on investment. Um, you, you finish up your section on small end marketing about you know, with, with, with a little bit of a synopsis on on why marketing is like a symphony with a great conductor. Um, can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, that, that's actually, a, I'm glad that you asked the question because that's one of, the, one of the bigger leaks in a leaky bucket of marketing. Right. So, um, so imagine a situation that company does good marketing. They got five tactics that they are working on for the year 2022. And each one of those five tactics is run and managed by a professional who is extremely good in his or her field. 
So I'm sort of saying I'm giving A plus grade on everything, right tactics, right execution, right people managing it, properly funded, everything is good. So okay. now you say, okay, so what can go wrong? Uh, well, <laughs> this is what can go wrong. And this is what usually does go wrong in most situations, even in the best of companies. They will run those five tactics exceptionally well as planned, but they'll run them without uh, checking with each other, mm -hmm. without creating a symphony. So, mm -hmm. so the, the metaphor I'm using in that, in that symphonic phrase is that you can have the best pianist, the best violinist, the best cellist, uh, the best trombone, best of everything, and they can play exceptionally well. Right. But unless they play in concert, unless they play the way it should be played uh, by the book, so to speak, by the, by the music sheet, sure. uh, it won't sound the same. Same thing applies to marketing as well. So you basically have to stop what we call random acts of marketing so that uh, you can get a bigger bank for your buck that you're already spending. So in fact, in some ways, this is the, uh, this, if, you, if you stop random acts of marketing, you don't spend a single dollar more. Mm. You're spending only what you were spending uh, mm. on those five tactics anyway. By just orchestrating them properly, you're going to get a much higher rate of return. Got it. Uh, so what is fake ROI? <laughs> yeah. Another damn yeah. lie. <laughs> uh, actually, you know, the inside story on this, the book, um, the idea of this book actually germinated from that chapter, even though it's, I think, chapter number 14. So it's yes. sort of, further down in my, uh, hmm. uh, in, in the book, but, but the book, the seed was that particular chapter. Right. And, and the reason for that was that I personally worked with many uh, business leaders and CEOs who took the position and they thought they were being very wise and, you know, sort of Jack Welch kind of uh, learning that, Hey, unless you can show me the ROI, I'm not going to spend any money doing it. like, hmm go and get me the ROI, otherwise go away. Right. Okay. Right. Now, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data nerd. I love ROIs, but I also realized that not everything can have an ROI. Right. Let me give you an example from the book. So if you drive down from San Francisco to San Jose or the other way around, it's a 50 mile distance, so it could usually take about two and a half to three hours because of the traffic. Mm. You will see about a dozen on either side of the road, dozen billboards by Apple. Mm -hmm. And they are usually for the iPhone. And they might have an occasional um, iPad billboard, but mostly they are iPhones. So, now, do you think Tim Cook or anyone else in the Apple company can very reasonably say how many iPhones, how many more iPhones <laughs> have been sold since they've been spending those millions of dollars on right. those billboards? Of course not. Of course not, right? right? But why are they doing it? Is Apple stupid? No. The reason they are doing it is because even though it cannot be measured as an ROI, they know it's a very good idea when the traffic is increasing, when there's so many people spending so much time on that Route 101, it's so much better to reinforce the idea of iPhone to existing iPhone users and to introduce iPhone to non-iPhone users. Hmm. In fact, if you look at their billboards, most of them are about photographs that customers have taken. Hmm. So hmm. if you are an iPhone user, it still is a useful billboard for you because you say, oh, wait a minute, I didn't know I can take a picture like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a positive message. If you're not an iPhone user, you get the message, oh, maybe I should switch. Maybe I can become a better photographer if I, if I bought an iPhone. So from my point of view, it's a brilliant, brilliant placement with, with no chance of getting a real ROI calculation, at least. Now, there is an ROI in the real world, but there's no ROI calculation. Got it. So it's, is your point, though, that you know, not everything needs an ROI when you're in marketing? No, I think your, your first point should be that, yes, ask for the ROI. Okay. But okay. just because it doesn't have an ROI, don't reject it. So, again, I don't know 
how they're managing it. But if, if I were to guess what Apple is doing is Apple is tracking what is the, what is the number of eyeballs that are currently being uh, exposed to, or what, is, what are the billboards getting exposed, exposure in terms of eyeballs uh, on, on, uh, on Route 101? Yeah. If that starts declining, if people start taking helicopters or <laughs> BART or something right. else, or working from home. I'm sure they'll, uh, or work from home, I'm sure they'll peel back on, on that spend. But they're not still calculating how many more iPhones we sold, and therefore here's the ROI. Got it. Got it. All right. So we only have a few minutes left. I do want to get your thoughts on just a couple of things before I let you go. Okay. Uh, Cause you do mention them in the book. Um, give me your thoughts about um, SEO search engine optimization. You talk about long tail vis-a-vis -vis SEO. What, what, what exactly do you mean by that? So uh, I think SEO is very important, um, but I think there are two, at least two uh, common pitfalls with how SEO uh, or how businesses think of SEO. One is they think of it as I need to do something with my website uh, so that um, uh, I'm current with the latest Google formula or the latest Google algorithm. Right. So I make a case over there that that's, that's BS. Uh, that should not be the driver at all. In right. fact, as evidence, as exhibit A for making my case that quit worrying about Google algorithm is something from Google's own website. Google's own website reveals, they give you four points addressing the business owner, what you ought to do about your website. Mm -hmm. And the, the short version of that is make your website, Mr. Business Owner or Miss Business Owner, make your website useful for your customers. Right. Don't worry about us, Google. Right. So if you make your website- on, you Focus on the customer and not on the clicks, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and Google says that we are smart enough to see whether you're focusing on your customer. And if you do a good job focusing on your customer, we'll give you points for it. We'll rate your, point, rate, rate your website higher. So don't worry about us, worry about your customer and you'll benefit on Google search as well. So that's sort of one. The second pitfall uh, is that when you work with, a, with an SEO company and you know, obviously you try to manage your budget, sure. you sort of say, no, I don't have, I, don't have, I cannot spend $10,000. I've got only $3,000 to spend every month. So then the SEO company says, sure, we can do that. Um, and what they'll do is they'll come up with phrases which are called long tail phrases, mm -hmm. which are rare phrases that, uh, you know, not so expensive to get higher rating on. Right. So it meets right. your budget. Not so expensive because nobody's searching on them. <laughs> exactly. So the problem is that you do rank higher on those search phrases. But the problem is that uh, your customers are really not searching for them. <laughs> now, again, I'm not dismissing the use of uh, long trail phrases. They are useful, but right. they are useful in very specific cases. I mean, if customers already know you and now you're trying to sort of um, fine tune or nuance their search, sure, long tail phrases are very useful. But if you're trying to reach your audience and you believe that they don't even know you exist, Long, long tail phrases are not going to uh, sort of uh, bring you to the fore in front of your customers. Got it. Well, so I only have a couple minutes left. I, you know, before I let you go, um, you, you, I mean, this book is great. You, you've gone through and talked about some of the, the lies about marketing, um, some of the facts, some of the fictions about, you know, about where you should be spending your money and what the customer is all about and, uh, you know, what technology is useful. Um, you know, in all the years you spent, you know, when you are, you're, you're investing in companies right now, you speak about this, you write about marketing. How do you feel the role of the marketer will change over the next decade or so? And let me preface this by, I, I just wanted to give you my, my opinion is that I, and see if you agree and if to, you know, to expand on it is that I, I am seeing more and more CMOs of larger companies come from financial backgrounds, uh, data-driven backgrounds. I, you know, I'm, a, uh, you know, I'm a CPA, if you haven't figured out by this whole package here. And I, I, I know a, a number of, of certified public accountants that have, that have migrated themselves from the financial end to, to marketing um, because of the data that's involved. And I, and I see that becoming 
a real powerful trend over the next decade. That's my point of view. Where do you see marketing going? And where, what, what do you see the qualities of a, of a CMO uh, you know, 10 years from now compared to today? So I think, I think that trend is going to continue. But I, the only thing I would add to that mm -hmm. is that that trend is not new. Right. I mean, you know, I'm an engineer. I joined marketing 30 years ago. Yes. And, uh, and even back then, uh, an engineer doing marketing was not unusual. Um, you know, especially for a B2B company. Right. So, so marketers coming from data-oriented background, whether it's accounting or, or engineering or science, uh, I think is not new and it's going to continue. And there's nothing wrong with that, to, to quote Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. um, the, the bigger trend that I th I'm hoping, and this, this is as much a prediction as much it is hope, is is centered around, around the topic of my book. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hoping is that marketeers will get the place on the table and in the C-suite that they actually deserve, not because they've earned it in the sense of, you know, as a reward, mm -hmm. but because of the value that they can bring to the business. So right now there's the dynamic that's going on that, hey, I, as a CEO, I'm very frustrated at marketing. I don't think I trust my marketing guy. I don't see why I should sit with him in, in, um, in the C-suite. Right. You know? but, and I'm suggesting that let's, let's re-examine this. Let's see why that frustration is there. Let's remove the reasons for this frustration. And then marketing is indeed a function in the business world, which actually can add significant value in driving growth. And growth is extremely important uh, for any business. So, so what I'm hoping and expecting with all this is that marketeers will get the rightful place uh, at the table in the C-suite uh, by not promoting lies and damn lies, but actually by doing real marketing. The book is called Lies, Damn Lies, and Marketing, Separate Fact from Fiction and Drive Growth. I've been speaking to Atul Minocha, uh, who is the author of the book, uh, you know, a professor and author, angel investor, mentor, uh, CMO, and all of that. Atul, thank you so much. Great advice, great book, really interesting um, conversations, and I think will be very, very popular among CMOs and really business owners um, and leaders who are looking to expand their businesses. So thanks so much for your uh, contribution. It's a great book. Thank you so much, Gene. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, the book is out there on Amazon and um, would love to get feedback from your audience as well. Both okay. good, bad, and ugly. Lies, damn lies, and marketing. <laughs> you can accept the truth. I know. So thank you. Exactly. Very much. Yeah. Hang out. And I'm going to say goodbye to you personally. But again, thank you so much for joining. And thanks everybody else for joining us on this episode of BizBooks. We'll be back soon.